Good morning. That was awesome. <laughs> it's one thing to, to sing a song. It's another thing to tell a story, isn't it? That was a testimony, and um, <clears throat> I think you guys could tell that. Uh, I asked Daniel to sing that. I don't know why. It's, it's really a tough act to follow when he sings, you know? But it's not an act like Don said earlier. We're, we're here to open God's Word and, and see just what a child of God does, what a, what a child of God lives like. So this morning, we're going to be starting a series through the book of James. And let me tell you why I've chosen uh, to preach through James. Um, James, is, James is what is considered wisdom literature, kind of like the Proverbs, only that, uh, you know, like the Proverbs, some of the popular ones you, you, you may have memorized or heard coming up through church. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on, on your own understanding. Or um, raise up a child in the way, we sh- the way they should go. And when he is old, they will not depart from it. Y'all are familiar with those. A proverb is something that is generally true. It's inspired. It's the word of God, but... We have some very uh, faithful parents that I know of, and just growing up, their faithful parents can raise up a child in the way they should go, but it doesn't always happen, does it? Proverbs aren't necessarily a promise. They're, They're statements that are generally true. James, however, is wisdom literature, but not in the same way of Proverbs. James has the privilege standing back post-resurrection, post-ministry of Jesus, the fullest revelation of God, and to say, to see, he witnessed, was an eyewitness to Jesus' life, and to say, this is how you live the Christian life. He addresses that in his time and place, what, what that would look like. And in that time and place, it was a, it was a, uh, a time where the church, he was writing to the, the Jewish Christians who were geographically scattered across the Roman Empire and across the world. This is a letter that's, that's written in general to, to Christians. He addresses uh, the things they would be uh, struggling with. This climate of great stress, persecution, pressure for the church. He deals with worry. He deals with doubt. He deals with fear, he deals with uncertainty, he deals with a lack of wisdom, money, the list goes on and on and on. James is very direct. And as I read through this a couple weeks ago, I thought, man, how how do we not open this up and give the church what it needs? I mean, does that list sound like anything anybody's experienced this year? Worry, doubt, favoritism, justice, Evidence of real faith, wisdom, money. I mean, these are things that every single one of us has dealt with. Trials, endurance. These are things that we'll we'll all cover during this series. We're going to take our time. We're going to go through this slowly. This is not my style. In fact, today I will preach on one verse, which I'm not sure I've ever done before. Uh, So this is new for, uh, for me as it might be from you hearing it from me. So if you would, um, open up to James chapter 1, and we'll look at verse 1. Would you all join me in prayer before we read the word? Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit breathe a breath of life on this congregation, on the body of Christ gathered today for people who at one time were lost and in darkness, maybe some of us still are, who were slaves to fear. Lord, I pray that you give us a frame of reference uh, for understanding our life as we look at James and who he was and, and how he positioned himself with you. And you help us to live faithfully in a way that honors and glorifies you and 
and expresses the love that you've shared with us. We pray these things in your name. Amen. James 1, verse 1. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who is James? Matthew 13, 55 details. It says, uh, when Jesus was doing his ministry, it says, is, this, is not his mother Mary and his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? So who was James? James was the half-brother of Jesus, fully from Mary, but Jesus being son of God, son of man, he, was, he had the DNA of Mary, but not of God. Jesus was uh, conceived by the Holy Spirit. So while James, his brother, uh, and the rest of Jesus' brothers and sisters, they were fully human. They had a fallen nature. Most of this uh, bio on, on James comes from John MacArthur. He does a really good study um, on who James was. But imagine being James. Imagine being any of the brothers and sisters of Jesus. You literally had the perfect older brother. And that may have not always been a good thing, right? Think about that. Growing up with a sibling that was never wrong, that was never disciplined, that as a child at the age of 12 understood things that the religious experts didn't understand, he was perfect. Never did anything wrong, never disciplined, never argued, was never disobedient, always perfect. MacArthur points out that at some point, Joseph and Mary had to say to the bro his brothers and sisters, why can't you just be more like Jesus, right? Can you imagine that, that standard that was put in front of you? You were younger, you always looked up to Jesus. And not only as a child, but it wasn't in that day and age, Jesus would have stuck around until he started his ministry. So even as an adult, up until he was 30, he would have lived at least near his parents, if not in the same household. He was the perfect carpenter. He was the perfect businessman. He never did anything wrong. I mean, imagine that. And James is always looking forward to Jesus. I hadn't heard this phrase before, but maybe you had familiarity breeds contempt. Right? Familiarity breeds contempt. I, I can't say that for sure, but maybe the scripture will, will establish that. Somebody's like, I had an older brother like that. <laughs> Mark 3 verse 20 says, And he came home to his hometown, and a crowd gathered to such an extent that they couldn't even eat a meal. When his own family heard of this, they went out to take custody of him, for they were saying, he has lost his senses. Or as some versions say, he is out of his mind. This is what his family thought of him. James was not a believer. You know, Jesus said a prophet has no honor in his hometown. Part of that came from his family. He has lost his mind. John 7 verse 5 says, not even his own brothers believed in him. So, James was always looking to a perfect, other, uh, a perfect older brother. James had a fallen nature. James was an unbeliever. James called Jesus crazy. He was out of his mind. But 1 Corinthians 15, 7 relays that after the crucifixion, Jesus appeared to James in his resurrected body, and this made James a believer. And not only a believer, but the book of Acts lists James after this as a pillar of the church, one of the leaders of the church in Jerusalem. This is where Christianity blew up, exploded from. And so James goes from being the little brother who could never live up to Jesus' example, to being the unbelieving brother, to being the unbelieving brother that calls Jesus crazy, to being a leader of the Christian church. In Jerusalem. 
shortly after the book of James is written, I say maybe less than 10 years, James was martyred. And martyr, the martyr stories are similar, but I'll, I'll give you kind of what I've gathered. There are a few different accounts of how James was killed. The Sanhedrin, the same basic group that killed Jesus, killed James. Supposedly, he, they know he was stoned for sure, but supposedly they brought him to the top of the temple where everybody could see, and they asked James what he thought of Jesus, basically. And when, when James confessed Jesus as Lord, they pushed him off of the top of the temple, and church, church uh, tradition says that he didn't die. And when he didn't die, then they stoned him on the ground uh, till he was dead. So James, the little brother who could never live up to Jesus' example, who, became, who had contempt, who called him crazy, who wasn't a believer, witnessed something that transformed his life, that, that changed him from all those things to a leader in the church, and someone who was willing to not only follow Jesus, but to give his life. So that covers James, who he was. But why, what I want to focus on today, and we won't be here long. Today is an introduction, but I think it's a very important one, and we can't get the rest of the book if we don't get this down. The, the thing I want to focus on today is how James identified himself. So look with me again in verse 1. James 1, verse 1. James, you notice what he doesn't do. He doesn't identify himself with the name, the brother of our Lord, or anything like that. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad. Greetings. So how does James identify himself as a bondservant? What, what does your translation use for that word if it's not bondservant? What do y'all have? Servant, slave. The Greek word is doulos. Almost everywhere in the New Testament you see the word servant or bondservant. That is a synonym for the word slave. James, the little brother who could never live up, the one who is unbelieving it, called Jesus crazy, called his own brother his master, James, a slave of God and of Jesus, of the Lord Jesus Christ. So th this is a controversial term today, right? We think of, we think of American slavery, but Roman slavery was, was much, much different. Um, it was not motivated by greed. It was not motivated by racism. Uh, in, in some instances, it was actually very gracious uh, to, to be taken as a slave. Uh, one, and, and think of the Roman Empire. What do you think of when you think of Rome? You think of these massive construction projects and these sprawling empires and Roman soldiers, right? Everywhere, everywhere, in every town, everywhere. And, and the Roman army was usually conquering an area. And when Rome would conquer an area, the people who didn't die were sold as slaves. Usually to... Um, the Roman army would take those people groups and basically give them to a broker or a slave trader. And then any, anybody who had the money could buy a slave. It was very common. Um, one out of every three or four people were slaves in the Roman Empire. <laughs> one out of every three or four people were slaves in the Roman Empire. Listen to what Roman slaves could do. Roman slaves could buy land. Roman slaves could own slaves. Roman slaves could buy their own freedom if they had the money to do it. So you're talking something different that's than the American chattel slavery of the South, the European slave trade. This was not, not the same thing. But you could be sold your life was not your own. You did not make decisions for yourself, usually. You were a slave. This is not an ideal uh, situation. 
So I think one of the primary things we have to do to understand and live out this book of wisdom as as we're looking in James is to reevaluate where we see ourselves in the pecking order of life. So the first question for you is, how foreign is it for you to consider yourself a slave of God? How many times have you introduced yourself to somebody as, hey, I'm Tyler, slave of God? Foreign, foreign thing, right? Why is it? Why is it we do it that way? Why is it we don't consider our sla- ourselves slaves? Think about the American idea of church and some of the lines that you've heard. I'll, I'll tell you some of them I've heard. Um, the music here just doesn't... Um, this is in the past, Joe, you know, not you. Uh, Music here just doesn't fit what uh, what I want it to. You know, the seats are, you know, I, I don't want pews. I, I want chairs in here because chairs mean you're something else. You know, uh, let's see. I'm just, oh, here's a good one. I'm just not being fed. Okay, don't, don't get me wrong. That can happen in a church. Uh, a, quote, pastor can not preach the Bible and you can not be fed. But, but who says those kind of things? Are, the, are those not the kind of things that you would hear from, like, a child? I mean, if, you're, if your own kids were saying those things about your house and that, I mean, we, we take such a, a privilege, a freedom in the way we consider church. Things are my way. No, no. James says, I am a slave of God. Jesus says, the one who is to be considered great, The disciples were walking along the road. I love this. Every time in the gospel, Jesus predicts his death. You know what happens? There is an argument about who's the greatest among the disciples. So Jesus just tells them, hey, when we go up to Jerusalem, the Son of Man is going to be delivered, and he's going to be crucified, handed over to sinners and crucified. What arises next is the disciples start arguing among themselves about who's the greatest, as if somebody could really do what Jesus did and take over. Um, So Jesus overhears their conversation, and he says, if you want to be great, the one who is greatest in the kingdom is servant of all. I guarantee your Bible says servant. The word there is doulos, slave of all. If you want to be great, you must be slave. The fact of the matter is you are a slave to something. The Bible doesn't, doesn't talk about this in a way that there's in-betweeners. Like you, you will be a slave to something. Romans 6, verse 16 through 18 says, Do you not know that when you present yourself to someone as slaves for obedience, excuse me, you are slaves of the one you obey, either of sin resulting in death, or of obedience resulting in righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. So the Bible doesn't give us an option. You will be a slave of something. Like Daniel saying, I hope you're not a slave to fear. And if you're a believer, you should not be. You don't have to be a slave to fear. You are a child of God. It's just not all that you are. If you had to pick between those two identities to describe yourself, to label yourself, to identify yourself, which one would you pick? Slave to sin or slave to righteousness and to God? We live in a world where identities are being presented as fluid. I'm not going to go all political on you, but um, identities are important. There are all kinds of identities that, that I embrace and that I'm responsible for. I'm a neighbor. I'm a friend. Uh, I'm a husband. Uh, I'm a pastor. I, I'm all these things. But just to give you an example for our parents in the room, Uh, all these little guys are going to grow up one day. And one day they'll sing their last song if they're in drama. 
Uh, they'll march on to the marching field one last time. They'll shoot their last basketball. They'll throw their last competitive pitch. Uh, they'll dance their last dance. And you know what follows shortly after that? Because when you identify yourself as a high school student, and probably all of you did this, hey, I'm so-and-so. I'm a basketball player. Identity, right? Those things are ripped away. And there's this scramble for identity and purpose. And you still do it. I'm an engineer. I'm a counselor. I'm a carpenter. I'm all these things. What happens when you lose those things? We try. And those kids, we, we, we try to scramble. Y'all got the sneezies this morning, guys. We try to scramble. I remember, what am I anymore? Not a basketball player anymore. Try to scramble. Oh, well, let me get some hobbies so, so I can, yeah, that's, that's what I am now. I like to do this and I like to do that. Or some people fill it with social life. I've got friends and I, I want to party and, and all these things. Let me remind you of something you hear here frequently. Blaise Pascal said, every man has inside of him a God-shaped hole in his heart that can only be filled by God. Jesus calls us to total followership, total lordship, full-on Taylor Swift, Jesus take the wheel, okay? I'm not a Taylor Swift fan, but that is actually a great song. I, I can't, what's that? Oh, Carrie Underwood, I'm sorry. You can tell how much of a fan I am. So, yeah, same thing to me. You know, Waylon Jennings said all the cowgirls sound alike, so, you know. Uh, but that song, I think, is actually great because I can't do this. You do it, God. I can't do it. Give me your way. Give me your way. Jesus said the time is fulfilled. Everywhere he went, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and what? Follow. Follow me. Jesus said to follow me. So challenge number one, what do we do with this? Be radical. Surprise yourself with the faith you are willing to put in God. Uh, Jan Janet handed me this little book called Questions Jesus a Asked. And in it, there's a story of this man who had a dog with an extremely long tail. And in order to reduce the amount of pain, the, the tail needed to be docked. But in order to reduce the amount of pain this dog experienced, he was just going to chop it off one inch at a time in order to save the dog. You know, he didn't want to give him too much at once. That's just, a, it's made up, guys. But you, you get the picture. And, and that's what we do in our life. Oh, God, I'm just going to give you a little bit. I'm just going to take a baby. Baby steps towards God are good, but sometimes we need to take big old leaps to get out of the circle we're in and to get into God's circle. Sometimes we need to make big decisions about our identity, our priorities, who we are, where our family's going, what we're going to be about. At the youth parent meeting, I challenge our parents with, with all these things. Guys, Make the big decisions about your children and about your family so that the thousands of questions that follow afterwards are already answered. Will we be at church? Yes, we will. If we have a ball game that gets scheduled Sunday morning, where are we going to be? Okay. Because you know your kids take to excess. The things that you relax on, the next generation makes an excess out of. Make the big decisions about important things that take care of the thousand tiny questions that follow. James does that. That's how James opens his letter. James sets an example for us, for the church. When he could have said, James, the brother of Jesus. Yeah, y'all listen to me. You know who I am. You know the family I come. He doesn't do that. James, a bondservant, a slave 
of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. In history, we read of how slaves were bought for the use to be at the disposal of their masters. But in the Bible, we see a God who in order to buy us, offered his own body to be broken for us. This is the kind of loving God we are called to give our allegiance to. The one who calls us son and daughter. The one who is the good shepherd that looks out for his sheep. The one who provides for our every need. The one who saw us. Though we were dead in our trespasses and sin, he was rich in mercy and made us alive together with Christ. This is the God we are called to lovingly obey. So as we open this study, I want you to know that as Daniel said, as he he gave his opening testimony, you don't have to be afraid. This is not a master that's just waiting to strike you down. This is a good master, a good God. So I wanted to roll through, if if you got them ready, Pete, just just to show to you how some of our examples in the faith identify themselves. So got those ready? Romans 1.1, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, an apostle set apart for the gospel of God. Let's go on to the next one. We'll just roll through these. Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Christ Jesus to all the saints of Christ Jesus who are in Philippi. Let's go ahead and go on. Keep going. Paul, a bondservant of God and apostle of Jesus Christ. Keep going. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours. Jude, a bondservant, Jesus Christ and the brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. It should be Revelation As Revelation opens, I want you to look at this. John doesn't doesn't open this like the other letters. But look who it's addressed to. Look at how the church is described. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his what? Bondservants. This is how the Bible identifies us. One of the ways, disciples, the most common. I didn't do a word study on this, but I know this phrase, this word, doulos, occurs over 25 times in the New Testament, very common, 10 times in Revelation. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his slaves. How do you think of that word when you hear it? Is it a positive connotation or a negative one? Think of it as who your master is, which God gave him to show his bondservants, the things which must must take place soon. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant, John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Go ahead and go to the next one. This is nearing the very end of your Bible here. And a voice came from the throne, Revelation 19. Give praise to our God, all you his what? Bondservants, you who fear him, the small and the great. Then I heard something like the great multitude, like the sound of many waters and like the hand or like the sound of mighty peals of thunder saying, and these are his bondservants. These are how they respond. Hallelujah, for the Lord our God almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made Herself ready. So we're not just children of God. We're not just bondservants. The body of Christ is the bride of Christ, waiting for the perfect bridegroom. Let's go ahead and go to the next one. Okay, yeah, just leave it there. We're gonna, I'm gonna need your help on this one because you, as his servants, have a scene in this last one. So when we get to verse 17, you'll have a slide that's, that's yours. And he said to me, this is the last chapter of the Bible, these words are faithful and true, and the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show his bondservants 
the things which must soon take place. Then Jesus said, verse 12, Behold, I am coming quickly. My reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they have the right to the tree of life and may enter into the city. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral persons and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who practices lying. And go ahead and stand with me, church. Verse 16 says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify you, to you these things for the churches. I am the root, the descendant of David, the bright and morning star. Go ahead. The spirit and the bride say, and let the one who hears say, and let the one who is thirsty come, and let the one who wishes to take the water of life without cost. Y'all may be seated. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. If anyone takes away from the words of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life, from the holy city, which are written in this book. He who testifies to these things says, and this is Jesus, yes, I am coming quickly. And how does the church respond? Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. These are those who are his bondservants the ones who are anxiously awaiting his return, the ones who love his presence, who are longing, who are ready for their master to come back. And if you've forgotten what kind of God, what kind of Lord Jesus was, Philippians 2 says, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, a slave being made in the likeness of men, being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. This is the kind of God we serve, not one who stands above you with a magnifying glass waiting to strike you, but a God who condescends to you to the lowest level, being tempted in every way you were, experienced hunger and pain and lowered himself and became like a slave. What do I have in common with James? Just like James, you were raised up to the standard of Christ. Just like Joseph and Mary, maybe, probably, I don't know, I'm just making that up, thought. Why can't you just be more like Jesus? That's the standard that you're held to, and you can't do it. You're desperately in need of the forgiveness Jesus offers. I don't live up to that standard. You don't. We don't. We can't. But Jesus still says, repent, believe, and follow. Secondly, you will be a slave to something. Well, what are you choosing to be a slave to? Slave to sin and death or God and life? I, I grant to you this is very black and white, and life is not, right? You're either this or that. But Paul says in Romans 7, in the present ongoing tense, about his struggle with sin, he says, you know, the things that I want to do, I don't find myself doing them. And the things I hate, those are the things I find myself doing. But just as Joe read earlier, Romans 8 uh, opens with this. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So even though we struggle, for those who are his, those who are who, truly his servants, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So the real question is, am I in Christ Jesus? Do I live according to the flesh or do I live according to the Spirit? In the Roman era, when people were broken, 
and they came to the end of their rope, just like the prodigal son, if that helps you to imagine it. And they said, I'm sick of being hungry. I'm sick of starving. I'm sick of not having anywhere to stay. They could sell themselves into slavery. They could find a landowner. They could find a business owner and say, I can't do it my way. Will you be gracious to me and open up your home? In exchange for my life, will you give me life? You have the means to provide for me. I can't, something I can't provide for myself. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of trying my own way. Will you have mercy? Will you take me into your household? A slave, a servant, a real believer says to God, I've tried my way. I'm sick of all the dead ends. I'm sick of trying my own way. My life is in your hand. Not my will, but your will be done, just like Jesus modeled for us. Have you said that? Can you say that? Are you saying that with your life? Have you shown that with your life? If you wonder why your faith has become stale and monotonous and boring and lifeless, it's because you refuse to live on the edge of the adventurous life that God grants to those who say, I'm your slave, Lord. I'll do whatever you put in front of me. This life is not mine. It's yours. Can I really call Jesus Lord is what it boils down to. The Bible says Jesus is Lord of all. Are you letting him be? James, a slave of God, and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Greetings. Will you all pray with me? Lord, in in this room, you know my struggles. You know the things that are in my life that, that haunt me and that I struggle with. In this room this week, Lord, you know of the loneliness, you know of the temptation, you know of the things that we fall and pray to and that we need to confess to you. Lord, as as we return to you, we ask that you remind us of your grace, you remind us that we don't have to be afraid, remind us of the master that we have who became like us and gave himself so that we can have grace and freedom and life. Lord, help us to be yours. Help us to give ourselves completely over to you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Would you all stand? good being with you this morning. Next week, we will cover more than one verse, I promise. We will uh, finish this before the end of the year, well before the end of the year, so don't be worried about that. Uh, It's good being with you this morning. Uh, Jeff, can you dismiss us from prayer this morning?